Hello everybody, this is Lester from Lester Watch Reviews. Uh, it's February 2019 and we have a very important anniversary this year. It's 60 years of the first automatic chronograph watch. So 60 years ago, back in February 1969, the first few examples were beginning to be seen of a revolutionary new design. So up to that point, there had never been an automatic chronograph. You'd had chronographs and you'd had automatic watches and never the two combined. Um, and people were beginning to want this new complication. You can imagine somebody at the racetrack, at the motor racing or horse racing, they wanted to time a lap. They press the chronograph and boom, nothing, because they'd forgotten to wind their watch. Their watch was a manual. Now, if they'd had an automatic watch, and if they wore it every day, it would keep wound with the movement of the wrist. And you'd never have a fail when you went to, to time a lap. So that's what, was, that's what people wanted. The race to produce the first automatic chronograph was heating up in the late 1960s. And it was mainly a race between three sets of manufacturers. So we had Seiko, we had Zenith, and we had a, a conglomerate or a combo meal deal, as one of my YouTube vloggers often calls it, uh, between four different manufacturers. So we had Dupois Dubras, who supplied the chronograph module. We had Hamilton Buren, who supplied the micro rotor movement, and then we had funding from Breitling and from Hoyer, Hoyer Leonidas. So let's uh, go through these three watches that I'm lucky enough to have on the table here. These are examples of all three manufacturers, and they're nice early examples as well. So we'll have a little chat about the watches themselves, the technical aspect, um, and then we'll have a chat about collectability and uh, cost of finding one of these second hand, for example. So on the left, we have the Seiko, first of all, and let's, let's zoom in a little bit on the Seiko. Now, this is the famous Seiko 6139. You can get loads of these on eBay and in the second-hand shops, uh, loads of different styles. This one is a February 1969. Um, now, if you look on the case back of Seiko watches, usually just, oops, under the word Seiko. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, if I can focus properly, but this is actually an example from February 1969. You've got the 9-2 on the case back there. Um, many people argue that Seiko is the first automatic chronograph just going on the dating of the case back. Now, the argument about which one was the first, what does that mean? The first to do what? Is it the first to produce... Uh, a, a small production sample? Is it the first to produce them in large numbers? Or is it the first one to actually put them to market? Now, Seiko, February 1969, on, on the case back of this one, I've even seen on the web a January 1969 case back. What were they? Were they pre-production? Were they samples? Or were they actually watches that were were destined to be on someone's wrist in the next couple of months. We don't know that precisely. Now, the Seiko has one register at the bottom there for your 30 minute counter. And it has a day and a date. So, you know, quite a simple thing, 40 millimeters across the case, very wearable. Good, good, good size for the, for for, mo for the modern day. It was quite a big watch in its day as well. Um, these are very collectible. 
uh, especially the earlier ones of the 6139 style. Uh, to get a nice early one, February, March, you'd probably be looking about uh, six or seven hundred pounds. But, you know, if you want to get a later one, you can pick these up easily for about, you know, 150, 200 pounds if you look in the right places. <clears throat> so moving on to the Zenith. This is the famous Zenith El Primero. Now, Zenith called themselves that with a bit of chutzpah, I think. El Primero, the first. Um, and what was Zenith thinking they were the first at? Well, Zenith produced a few pre-production examples at a trade fair in January 1969. Um, and that's what they go on to be the, the El Primero, the first. Although we had to wait until probably October 1969 for any Zeniths to actually get into the shops. So again, it's debatable which one is first. Um, this has got three registers, very nicely balanced dial. Uh, you've got your sub-seconds over on the left. You've got your 30-minute counter on the right. And you've got uh, a 12-hour counter at the bottom. So, you know, you can time nice long runs of things without having to uh, to work out how many times it's gone round the dial. Like on the Seiko, for example, it's only got 30 minutes. So if you wanted to time something an hour or two hours, you'd have to remember how many times that little hand had gone round. With the Zenith, you've got no trouble at all with that because you've got up to 12 hours. Now... These first two movements, Seiko and Zenith, are both integrated chronograph movements, which means that the, the chronograph part of it and the watch movement are all integrated into one movement. Um, and this makes for a, a, a technically more interesting movement, debatably. Uh, many people uh, think that the Hoyer which we'll look at in a moment, which is a modular chronograph, is not really technically up there, as, as well as the Seiko and the Zenith. Uh, the Zenith beats at 36,000 BPH. So that means that in theory you can time things up to a tenth of a second, uh, a high beat movement. And again, a lot of people rate that movement over movements with a lesser beats per minute, such as the Seiko and the Hoya. Now, if you want to pick up a nice example of this watch, which is an A385, uh, you're going to be looking at at least, I think, three grand, three or four grand. Uh, the, the technical aspects of the movement the fact that they weren't produced in very large numbers all means that the prices are, are high on the second-hand market. If you were to go for the other colour variant of this, with A386, for example, which has three overlapping coloured subdials, then you can pretty much quadruple that at least. You'd be looking at at least 10 grand for one of those. So they're very, very collectible, these El Primeros. So let's move on to the Hoya now. Get the little Zenith out of the way. This is a Calibre 11 Hoya Carrera. Beautiful dial, two sub dials. You've got your 30 minute counter on the right and you've got your 12 hour counter on the left. Um, no running seconds, so it's a little bit tricky at the beginning of the day if you're just uh, firing this one up to work out if it's actually going or not. Easiest way is just to press the chronograph hand and see if that goes. And then you know you're in business. Um, so as I said, this is a modular system. So the chronograph module is, is placed uh, on top of the, uh, the watch movement with the micro rotor itself. Uh, so this makes this watch a little bit more bulky than the other ones. You can see it's quite a high watch. Uh, again, 38 millimeters. Very wearable. You can get this under a cuff, under a shirt cuff, quite easily, but not perhaps quite as easily as the Zenith. Um, 
you've got your, your date at the bottom there. Uh, interestingly with this calibre 11 is that the winding crown is over there on the left. And that's because Hoyer wanted the buyer to remember that they didn't have to wind it. So they just removed the crown from the right hand position where it normally is. It's automatic. You don't have to wind it. Don't worry about the crown. But of course, if you want to manually wind it, you still can with the crown, with a downward movement this time and not an upward movement. So the collectability of Hoy Carrera, as uh, you know, as everyone knows, is 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 high. They're very sought after. Uh, this particular reference is probably one of the better value references. Double one five three. This one is. Um, if you're going to go for the panda or reverse panda. Uh, I think you'd be looking in the sort of five or six grand area. These 1153s you can find for maybe three to four grand, uh, depending on condition. So here we are. We've got the, the three watches, which uh, back in the day were vying to become the world's first automatic chronograph. The Seiko, the Zenith and the Hoyer and company. Very good size for today's wrist, you know. The I think the, the Seiko is about 40 mil, Zeta 38, and the, the, the Hoya 38 as well. Uh, almost the sweet spot for a lot of people's wrists. Um, so, just at the end, I'm going to show you another little uh Zenith that I've got. Um, it's a nice rare one. Uh, I haven't got an example of the A386, but I have got an example of this one which is an, a 3817. So as you can see, this again has the uh, the coloured subdials. Uh, the colour doesn't come out very well on the video, sorry about that. But you've got a, a blue subdial on the right, uh, a sort of grey black one on the on the bottom, and then a, a lighter subdial on the right. Uh, beautiful dial. <clears throat> they only made this watch uh, in numbers of about a thousand so it's very collectible um, and very expensive as well you'd be looking at at least uh, I think probably six grand uh, for this particular one which is still surprisingly better value than the 386 which was made in larger numbers so you know explain that one to me I don't know about that but uh, let's do a quick wrist shot at the moment if I just steady my camera there, I'll just slip them on and I've got a 17 centimeter wrist so you can just see see what they're like on that. So here is the Seiko. Nicely proportioned as you can see. And I'll pop the Zenith on for you. <clears throat> I won't, won't do the strap up with that but uh, there's the Zenith, very nice. And then lastly, I will do the Hoyer. Sorry for the uh, short delay. Should provide some interlude music, shouldn't I? There we are. And there's the Hoyer. So, all of them very wearable on 17 centimetre wrist. So that's it. Thanks very much for watching everybody and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.